Okay. Well, welcome to everybody and everybody online. And um, it's preaching time, Bible time, teaching time. And um, make them laugh before you hit them, eh? <coughs> this guy was talking to all his mates and he was telling them all about how great his new hearing aid is. And someone said to him, what kind is it? And he said, 230. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I was to open to the book of Romans, chapter um, 14. First of all, it starts off and it says, Receive one who is weak in faith but not to dispute over doubtful things. And so you see that some people are stronger in faith than others. Some people can be weak. You all know that faith means simply to be convinced of, convicted of, persuaded of, by implication, trust and believe. And when the Holy Spirit is able to convince you and convict you and persuade you of something, and you say, I believe, <coughs> well, that's an act of faith. And so that's how we live, isn't it? The Bible says he just shall live by faith. Romans 12, 3 says, every man was dealt a measure of faith. So everyone has the ability to trust and believe by faith, to get saved and to live by faith. But some people are strong in faith, some people are weak in faith, some people have shipwrecked their faith. But nevertheless, we are not to judge one another there. It says, people stand or fall by God alone. And when we read there, there's all sorts of things in this um, passage. You know, one's faith, they can eat meat. Another one's faith can only eat vegetables. Um, And it talks about worshipping a a certain day. Some people have this day they esteem high. Some people worship on a Saturday. Some people worship on a Sunday. But it says not to get too hung over on those things. And down further it says... Do not drink wine or eat meat or do anything that will cause someone to stumble. But then all of a sudden, <coughs> we have verse 17. And that's what we're going to look at and that's what's going to come up on the screen. And all of a sudden, in the middle of all this discussion, is the main thing. And the main thing is, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so that's our text for this morning. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now you might say, there's four subjects here. You're not going to get much out of that text other than the words themselves. But when we study and we cross-reference, you'll be surprised what we can learn. And first thing we need to understand is, it says, in the Holy Spirit. Everything is in the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 2.18 says that we have access to the Father through the Spirit. You can't have access to the Father but by the Spirit. You can't even get saved um, without the Spirit. John 16.8 talks about when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict of sin, righteousness and judgment. Remember in John 3, Jesus said, you must be born again. And he says, born again? (coughs) How can you enter your mother's womb a second time? He says, you're born above, born of the Spirit. We can't be born again even without the Spirit. You can't even know you're saved without the Spirit. Romans um, 8.16 says, the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Romans 8.14 says that we are led by the Spirit. I mean, we don't even know how to pray but by the Holy Spirit, Romans 8.26. We don't know how to pray, so he helps us and he intercedes for us. The Bible says in Ephesians 5.18, Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Hallelujah. We need to understand this morning that everything is about being in the Spirit. The Comforter has come. And John 14, 16 says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. Another one, another of the same kind, another helper or comforter you might have there, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him for he dwells in you and he'll be with you. I will not leave you as orphans. He's come to abide. He's come to dwell. 
He's come to us stay. Verse 26 says, but the helper, see, he's called the spirit of truth, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, is pure, is morally blameless. When the, the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I have said to you. And so you might have comforter in your Bibles. You might have counsellor. Um, you might have helper. You might have advocate, someone who stands in place of another, an intercessor. That's because the Greek word parakletos means all those things. But unfortunately, in English, you can only put one word in. But he is the comforter. He is a helper. He is a counsellor. He is our intercessor. Dr. Ray, in his book, Handbook on the Holy Spirit, puts it like this. A parakletos basically means somebody who comes alongside to help, um, to help, to intercede, to counsel, to stand in for. He's like a personal friend, someone who is, in a sense, could be an advisor um, to someone, to a governor or, or even to a king. And so the, the Holy Spirit, he is your comforter. He is your counsellor. He is your helper. He will stand in for you. He will help you uh, when the enemy attacks. And I don't know what the challenge is for you, but everything is in the Holy Spirit. And the challenge for me is that I need to be led by the Spirit. Kevin doesn't need to be leading Kevin. It's easy to do. But it... It's not about eating and drinking, but it's about righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Next subject, righteousness. Righteousness simply means in right standing with God. Innocent, not guilty. Originally, it meant to meet the standards of the one who set them. So have you met the standards of the Roman governor or whatever, you were a righteous citizen. And so you know that to be righteous, you will already know this, of course, you know that you are righteous, you are innocent, not by your good works, simply by faith. You know that Holy Spirit was able to convict you, convince you and persuade you that Jesus wanted you to accept him and what he did on the cross, and you said, I do. And so then you were saved by faith. You weren't saved um, by good works. I mean, you know that. And so, what did you do to get saved? I'm sorry, but you did do something. You did respond. You did repent. You did call upon the name of the Lord. You did confess your sins. You did make him Lord. You know, if you didn't have to do anything, you know, everybody would be saved. And so, yes, we do do something. It is an act. We do do something. Some person might be woken up at four o'clock in the morning. He's a non-Christian and something tells him to go to church and he gets up and he cooks breakfast and he gets all the kids and he gets to church and um, kids are screaming. And um, he responds to the message and he gives his life to the Lord. Well, that was a big effort, wasn't it? There's a lot of work in that. But he was still saved by grace. It wasn't his own work. See, our own works, our own righteousness, are filthy rags. But if God asks you to respond or to do something, then that is good. Otherwise, everybody would be saved. We need to respond. <clears throat> and so the Bible tells us that in 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he who made him knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. And hallelujah, when you responded, you become righteous. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You can't ever get any more righteous than that, and that's your legal standing in heaven. Hallelujah. But you know, there's a lot of people that almost think that because they're righteous, they're God. And they think that they can't sin or they can't do anything because they're righteous. You need to understand that your legal standing is you are righteous because you met his standards for salvation. But now you don't do everything right and you have to live righteously um, in this present age. 
Titus 2.12 says, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts that we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present age. How can you live righteously if you're already righteous? 2 Timothy 2.21, therefore if anyone cleanses himself, cleanses, I'm righteous, from what is dishonourable, he will be a vessel for honourable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Flee useful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace. How can you pursue righteousness if you're already right? Simply because you are right in his standing, you have met the conditions for salvation. But have you met his conditions for your family, for your character, for your finances and everything else? I don't think so. That's why we have to live righteously in this present age. 1 John 2.29 If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices... Hmm, how can I practice righteousness? Aren't I already righteous? Legal standing you are for salvation. If you get saved and then you die soon after, you're going to heaven because you're righteous. He sees the blood. But don't let's kid ourselves... We have to live righteously. 1 John 3, 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I thought I was righteous. Yes, you are righteous in his sight for salvation. You've met those conditions. But you need to live righteously as long as you live. 1 John 5.17 All unrighteousness is sin. So every time we miss God's mark, that's unrighteousness. We are righteous in his sight for salvation, but we don't always do what's right. And so if we confess our sin, he is faithful to forgive us. So you might ask then, that if I am righteous... But now I have to live righteously. How do I do that without getting in the flesh and without it being a works problem? Well, it's not a works problem because everything is in the spirit. And so we need to go to a text, which is Romans chapter 16 and verse 17, which is coming up on the screen. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is a power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. See, everybody knows the just shall live by faith. Everyone knows that you were saved by faith. Everyone knows that they were convinced and persuaded by the Holy Spirit they needed to accept Jesus and they said, I do. Everyone knows that's faith, that's an act of faith. But now we live by faith. So now the Holy Spirit may convince you and persuade you how to live in your marriage, how to live in your character, um, how to do your finances. And when you say, I do, then you're living by faith. Every act of faith is an act of faith in its own right. But most people forget this verse, that the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Righteousness is being right. It is meeting the standards of the one who set them. You've already done that to be saved, have eternal life. You're already righteous in his sight. But now for you to be righteous in your character and righteous in your in your marriage or whatever, it's not a struggle in the flesh or, or a good work. Is it, It's revealed to you. Righteousness is revealed from faith to faith. So if you're reading the Bible today and the Bible is able to convince you and persuade you, that's how you treat your wife. And you say, you're convinced, you say, yes, I do, that's right, I'm going to do that by the help of the Spirit. Guess what? You're now living righteously. You're doing what's right. You've just met his standard. So you're righteous. Now you read something about your finances. And so you say, yes, I agree. So you're living righteously. 
Same with your character. If he says, don't steal, you say, yes, I'm convinced. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm now going to be an honest Christian. What are you doing? You're living righteously. You're not struggling. You're not striving. It's not a good work. It's just being revealed to you from faith to faith. And every time you obey God's word, you're living righteously. The only problem is that somewhere that you may slip up because of tiredness or, or just because you're human, but then you confess it and you're walking and living righteously again. The only time it's a problem is when you get a whole hoop of Christians and just do what they want to do. And they're disobeying God's word and they just don't do it. That's the problem. But if we obey or attempt to obey and allow the Holy Spirit to lead us into that and we say yes to that, you're living righteously all the time. It's not a struggle. It's not striving. Why? Because the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Next subject. Peace. Peace is a spiritual force. Uh, follows spiritual principles. Um, peace is absent of strife. And it's something too, it's like, it's almost like a free gift the same. Is um, righteousness is given as a one-off thing for your salvation, but you live righteously. And so peace... Um, just, just comes because, um, well, Philippians 4, 7 says, you know, that um, he gives us a peace that passes all understanding. Romans 8, 6, to be spiritually minded is peace. Um, Ephesians 2, 14, for he himself is our peace. And there's, there's many scriptures, but when you give your life to Christ... Um, Peace comes because there's an absence of strife. There's, like there was conflict. You, you, you didn't know where you were going to go when you died. You, you didn't understand things. I mean, your life was in a mess. But then when Christ come in, peace come, hallelujah. And because it's a fruit of the Spirit and the Holy Spirit is actually um, li living in us. But it's an interesting thing that we have to keep our peace. And we have to hold our peace. Because you see, as a Christian, it's almost like it automatically comes in a sense as a gift. Because when Christ comes into your life, peace comes into your life. Now, it's not just the Hebrew word shalom. Yes, it's absence of strife, but they would take it further. The Jews would say that, um, um, you know, there's no... Um, conflict or turmoil in your finances or, or in your marriage or that, that they would say that um, absence of strife from sickness. Um, they, they would call it, you know, a, a whole package. But even when you got saved, there's an absence of strife. There's a calmness because you're saved. But in your, in your inner person, in your... Um, soul, mind, will and emotions. You see, you could also be living in a place where there's strife, where there is conflict, where there is war, where there's all sorts of turmoil in certain workplaces, but there can be still an absence of strife in your spirit because you're growing inwardly um, day by day. Um, you're being trained and taught by the Holy Spirit. So everything around you can be in turmoil, but you can still um, be at peace. But we have to be careful. We have to keep our peace because if we let conflict come in and strife come in, um, you can lose that sense of peace. But there's also a sense that peace can come because we're righteous and we live righteously. But do you understand there's also a sense that we make peace? Acts 10.36 preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. So we go out and we preach peace. And in a sense that we can bring others into the Lord and they can have peace. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. James 3.18. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, Flee youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love and hope. And those who call on the Lord of a pure, pure heart. And so there's a sense that even though that 
Peace is a gift. We pursue it. We follow after it. We make sure we don't lose it. We make sure strife and turmoil doesn't come into our life. That's how we're righteous for salvation, but we've got to make sure we live righteous. Peace will automatically come as a fruit, but we need to follow after peace. Um, and, and let, Colossians 3.15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you are also called in one body. Be thankful. So we've got to let peace rule. We've got to let peace um, govern. And you know, peace isn't just automatic. It may, it may be in your life and how you live, because you're in control of that. But what about the church? What about workplace? What about other places? You see, peace in the church is built on holiness and righteousness, not compromise. You can't just keep everybody happy in the church by doing what they want to do and sweeping the church's sins or whatever under the carpet. It just doesn't happen that way. So in a sense, you know, we, we actually, although peace can come because he's the prince of peace and he lives in us and torm all goes, but we need to make sure that we make peace. We need to make sure we hold our peace and we keep our peace and we let nothing um, rob us of our peace. Isaiah 32, 17 says, The work of righteousness will be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever, and my people will live in a peaceful habitation. Next subject. Joy. I think why it says... The kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, and they are in that order. You can't get saved without the Holy Spirit. You have to be righteous or you're not going to have any peace. And once your righteousness and peace is in your life, joy will just appear. Joy, um, gladness, cheerfulness, joy. It should just come because it's a fruit. But if you lose your peace and you get in turmoil in your inner self and in your life, you'll find joy will go out the window um, fairly smartly. Joyfulness, cheerfulness, calm, delight, gladness. Be exceedingly joyful. It's been once said that when a happy man or a joyful man or a cheerful man walks into the room, it's as if another candle has been lit. It's as if the joy and thankfulness, it's like it just expels the darkness. And when we are God's people, when we're full of joy and calm and happiness and delight, you know, it's showing the world that Christianity is worthwhile living. But however, just because somebody smiles and looks happy doesn't mean to say that it's real joy. Because if you don't know Christ, you really can't have real joy and happiness. Some people just smile. They look happy. One man is very depressed and he goes to a doctor and he tells him all his problems. And the doctor says, well, what you need is some joy, some happiness and laughter. He said, look, there's a circus in town. <clears throat> Why don't you go to the circus tonight? That man will give you some joy and happiness and um, cheerfulness. And he said, I am that clown. So the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. No joy, no strength. James 1.2 says, Consider it joy when you face trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. You see, you count it all joy. If you're going through some struggles and you're going through some trials, I tell you what, if you, if you count it joy... If you keep turmoil out of your life, you will get through it. It might be hard. But if you say, why do I have to go through this? I gave my life to Christ and he's made me go through all this and this has happened and that's happened and it's not fair and that's it. I'm just sick of, the, sick of it. I'm not going to church for six months. I'm just going to stay home and I'm just going to study the word. And, and guess what just happened? You've just got a whole lot of conflict in your life and turmoil. You just lost your peace and joy went out the window. So that's why it says to count it all joy. Because if you don't keep that attitude right, you're just going to get robbed just like that. 
And that's how it works. <clears throat> so you see, don't let anything rob your peace. Isaiah 26, 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Now, I just want to tell you a little secret this morning. And it's a secret. That's why I'm talking really quietly so no one can hear it. It's just a, a secret between you and me. And um, keep your mind stayed on him. I have a little problem there. Sometimes I'm praying. Sometimes I'm in church worshipping and singing a song and my mind has gone somewhere else and I haven't even told it to. It just went there. I hope I'm talking softly enough because we don't want anybody to hear. But, you know, if you have a little secret and you want to share it with me, you know, I'll keep it a secret. No one will hear. Just talk softly like I am. But that's true, isn't it? Once your mind starts wandering and goes places, it's not long and peace and joy are gone. Philippians 4.8 Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things which you have learned and received and heard in me. Do these and the God of peace will be with you. And so if we could put on a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, hallelujah. If we can study his word and, and speak good things and, and just keep our minds stayed on him, then peace and joy won't go out of the window. Now, you'll be pleased to know no more subjects. <laughs> we got through them. Andrea, could you come and play, please? <clears throat> Hallelujah. So in a few minutes, <clears throat> time just not yet, but in a few minutes' time, um, we'll go off the air and um, uh, we're going to um, take up our offering. And anyone online... Um, if um, you, you want to give, you can give also. Um, if you go to our website or our church app, you can find um, how to give. But we also want to have a time of prayer for anybody that feels like um, they want to come up for prayer. But I just want to pray first. And I just want to <coughs> close it like this that we thank you, Lord, and I pray that your prayer too this morning, that we can thank the Lord and that we've heard this morning that everything is in the Spirit. We're not to be drunk with wine, but we are to be filled with the Spirit. We are to be led by the Spirit. The Spirit helps us to pray. You know, can we respond to that? You know, I am this morning. Sometimes I have been led by myself. But from this day forward, we want to be led by the Spirit. And I hope that not only has that challenged me, but has challenged you this morning. And our prayer is that everybody under the sound of my voice says, yes, it's not about eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And my prayer is this morning that you respond to the challenge also that yes, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You can't get any more righteous than that. If you die tomorrow or, to, or the next day, you're going to heaven, hallelujah. You've met his standards for salvation, but you need to respond that we need to live righteously. We need to practice righteousness. <clears throat> and I hope you got the revelation this morning that it's not a strive and a struggle in the flesh but the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Anytime the Spirit of God convinces you and persuades you of something and you say, yes, it's not only an act of faith, but it's living righteously. I hope that you can respond to that this morning the same as I am, because I have made many mistakes, but I still know that I can pick myself up, that if I fail, I can ask forgiveness and he cleanses me from all <coughs> unrighteousness. 
And my prayer is that everybody in this room has the peace of God in their hearts and knows the peace of God in their heart. But I hope that you, like me, can accept that challenge that we can't let anything rob our peace and we've got to pursue peace. And when turmoil comes in, it's hard. And we thank you, Lord, that, that peace and joy are fruits of the Spirit. It's not a struggle and a strive, but if we can live righteously and keep strife out of our life and we can keep our minds stayed on Thee and we can praise Him and say good things and worship Him, then peace and joy shall come. And we just pray that everybody in this room and everyone online, um, and though this was four sermons this morning, very quickly, very shortly, lots left out. But my prayer is that not only me, but everybody in this room and online has that revelation. That it's not just about eating and drinking but it's about righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost and in that order. And that's a revelation you need. You can't get saved without the Holy Spirit. You can't have peace without righteousness. And then peace and joy will follow. You can't have joy without peace. And so basically that's the main thing. The kingdom of God. It's not about eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And I just pray that everybody gets that revelation this morning because it's just so, so important. And if you have a different idea after what I've said, you're not going to believe anything I said anyway, so that's up to you. But I believe that this is God's Word and it's there for us to grab hold of it if we want it. So God bless you. And um, to those online, we just say goodbye. God bless you. Have a good week. Um, Worship the Lord. Uh, thank you very much for being with us this morning. And we, we go offline now. And uh, we're just going to take up our tithes and offerings. Frank, if you want to um, grab the, the tin.